Awesomers, it's me, Steve Simonson, and I'm back again with another episode of Awesomers.com podcast. And today I'm joined by my good buddy, Patrick Myoho. Perfect. Huh? Pretty good. All right. Yeah. So uh, uh, full disclosure, everyone, I did receive some coaching ahead of time. And uh, my initial suggestion to Patrick was wrong. Uh, so just so you know, my scorekeeping uh, skills, uh, I'm still below 50% of getting names correct. So, uh, Patrick, thank you for joining us. And I'm already, um, I've already read in the, the bio to the, the audience, and so they know a little bit about you. But maybe in your own words, you could just tell us, you know, kind of where you live and, and what you do day to day uh, right now. Sure. Uh, my family and I live in West Michigan, and I am director of supply chain for a company called World Resource Partners. And what we do is we work with companies um, all around the world, actually, as far as a supply chain. But what we really do is we source um, products. We do engineering so we can help start up companies. But we source products. We manage suppliers. We handle logistics. We have consolidation ability. And we basically combine all of these um, assets that we have into taking headaches away from other companies that want to start out sourcing in China. That's not for everybody. A lot of these companies are in that growth mode from, let's say, 20 to $100 million. So we kind of fit in that level. They don't really want to send the whole team out there, but they want to be able to take advantage of not only the pricing, but right now the, the capacity that outsourcing to Asia or other uh, continents or other areas offer. Yep, that's a, a very big important thing. And uh, that whole um, concept of supply chain, outsourcing the supply chain logistics and, and uh, even the vendor management and so forth, um, from the sourcing side all the way through to the delivery side is something we're going to talk about a little bit later. And I, I, it's a, something that I think is vexing to many new entrepreneurs, especially, uh, you know, somebody just trying to launch their first brand or their first item on uh, a, a platform like Amazon or their own e-commerce site, they can be, you know, they can get gummed up at the UPC code level, let alone trying to find a product, find a supplier, source it and get it into the country. So I hope you're going to be able to share some advice with us uh, about that as we get into this episode. More than happy to. Glad to hear it. So uh, before we, uh, I'm going to tease this before the break here just a minute, but I always like to start at the beginning. So I want you to think very carefully about where you were born and we're going to find out right after this. Okay, we're back again, and I know everyone is on pins and needles to figure out where Patrick was born. Uh, I, I think I know the answer to this, Patrick. I've written it down. I've sent it in my secret ballot, but please share with the audience. I was born in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Nerds! I was guessing Hawaii. I don't know why. I am half or I am like 40% Hawaiian. 40%? Uh, that's a very precise number. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's in that area. Uh, so my dad uh, it was born and raised in Hawaii. He is... Uh, you know, uh, Hawaiian by blood came here uh, to go to college back in the 60s and met my mom and had three boys and here I am. How about that? All right. Well, there was some Hawaii connection. I was uh, I was 100 percent wrong, but uh, I'm going to call it a moral victory. Um, let's see. So so tell me, you, you mentioned uh, your dad and, you know, kind of coming over to go to college. What, what did your dad do uh, in terms of vocation? Uh, he started off as a teacher and then my grandfather, uh, my mom's dad owned a large equipment um, equipment company as far as a construction equipment company, like mm -hmm. uh, loaders, pavers, um, uh, bulldozers, that kind of stuff. Um, and in the late 60s, early 70s, teaching uh, didn't have the sort of prestige that it does now. Um, some would argue it still doesn't. Um, but he didn't, uh, you know, he had a lot of summer jobs after teaching. Um, and decided to go work for my grandfather at the dealership and, you know, became uh, one of their top salesmen, became a sales manager, ended up being president of the company for a long time. Wow. How about that? that that's an unexpected evolution from teacher to uh, president of a heavy equipment uh, distributor. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> now, did they sell the big stuff, the brands that we would know? Uh, can you yeah, uh, for, for a long time, um, the company sold, uh, it depends how far back you can remember, but Clark equip Equipment was one of them. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Barber Green, which was a, a line of, uh, of paving equipment, uh, Fiat Alice, uh, which in the 80s, uh, Fiat bought out Alice Chalmers and they joined in the Fiat Alice. So that, that was one of the lines. So a, a lot of diverse lines from a lot of the small paving guys to the, to the big dirt movers. 
Well, yeah, that's uh, quite a specialized thing. And so that was kind of what your dad ended up doing. How about your mom? What was she doing uh, around this time? No, my mom did a lot of things. She, she went from being a substitute teacher. Uh, she's actually was trained as a fine artist. So she ended up going back to school after getting married. And I think I was like around a teenager. She went back to college, got her fine arts degree. Uh, so she kind of did some side work as an artist and a photographer, sculptor. And then she ended up being the clerk of our township that we live in, the local township, and then becoming a supervisor. Hmm. And that wow. was, uh, you know, her evolution was kind of the same. It, it didn't start out on one way going to the other. And I think that kind of passed on to me as well. Yeah, that's very interesting. Now, how about any siblings? Are you uh, solo or do you have some others? No, I'm classic middle child syndrome, Steve. All right. Well, uh, well, let's Marsha, Marsha, Marsha this thing. Uh, who else you got? Uh, any uh, brothers or sisters? And if so, how brothers. many? Yep, I have an older brother and I have a, a younger brother. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Oh, boy. Buckle up, everybody. Uh, we're going to get into some emotion here. We've got the middle child. Uh, how about your, your, your brothers? Are they showing into uh, any entrepreneurial bend, or how does that look? Yeah, I think they both have a little bit of an entre entrepreneurial bent. Um, but, you know, all three of us right now basically have jobs, and, and we have these side gigs and uh, entrepreneurial um, little toys, I guess, right now. I, I guess people call them from the outside looking in that we like to, like, that we like to play with. So. Yeah, yeah, I like that. So now, do you think that is it because your parents were so flexible in their evolution that you guys just kind of uh, have this adaptive personality, or or what? What do you attribute that kind of general uh, dabbling in the entrepreneurial world? Yeah, I I can't speak for my brothers. I know I can speak for me. Is that uh, you know my my grandfather was a big influence as far as that. I mean, uh, you know, in the forties, uh, right before World War II broke out, before he joined the service, you know, he started this company. He worked for a Ford Motor Company uh, for a few years, and then went to go work for a different uh, dealership. And then uh, one of the sales guys talked him into let's start a dealership ourselves. And so they they had uh, an office in the east side of the state of Michigan. And then my grandfather moved over to Grand Rapids and started up. How about that? Yeah, boy, right before World War II, probably not an optimal time to start a, a dealership. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. But, you know, it lasted for 60-some uh, years. So All right. Well, we'll say you got through it then. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty good. Um, now, how about university? Uh, what what uh, choice did you make in terms of university? Go, no go? Oh, I went to, I went to college. Um, I actually have a bachelor's in communications with a minor in English, and I have a master's in education. Oh my, that's uh, well, highly educated there. Um, now, it's interesting to hear the master's in education. That sounds like you're going down the teaching route at some point early on. Yeah, at one point I, uh, I did my student teaching. I made it all the way through and I, I loved being in the classroom. But at that time, I don't think I was ready to handle a lot of the uh, politics that come along with teaching as far as handling parents, handling uh, the administration. And at that point, uh, I just wasn't mature enough. and and to be honest, too, there, there were a lot of teachers coming out of our area and not enough jobs. And I was, you know, just about to get married and, and I needed a job. So I, you know, the teaching gig didn't work out. So, you know, I stayed at the one I had and then that led into another job. Yes, necessity is the mother of invention. It's time to get creative, everybody. Yes. <laughs> um, so tell me about your, your maybe after the student teaching, what, what was your first proper job uh, since you were seeking a, a job? Uh, right out of college, when I was working on my master's, I was actually a substance abuse uh, treatment specialist for five years. So hmm. I worked in a youth home that was uh, local here. And uh, the, like I said, the focus was on substance abuse counseling. Oh, that that's was, fascinating. I bet that has a lot of stories that go along with it. Yeah, there's, uh, that, well, you know, I learned a lot as far as, that's where I really learned how to network, to be honest with you, because you're dealing with so many diverse personalities. Everybody's got baggage and you're trying to connect with people who are so different from you in one aspect, but have all these similar traits and, and trying to break through, make connections. It doesn't always work but at least you're able to recognize how to do that and how to pick up on certain cues that people um, have when they're talking, you know, uh, develop a sense of when to listen, you know, uh, how to develop empathy, um, because sympathy you just can't do, but empathy is, is something that uh, you can always give somebody else, you know, when they're, when they're telling a story, whether it's good or bad or, or in between. 
Oh, my empathy coach will be thrilled to hear you uh, uh, developing that skill. Uh, <laughs> believe me, she thinks I lack empathy, and she's probably right. <laughs> uh, in truth, all of us need to develop those skills, whether it's listening or empathy or the ability simply to network. And that seems like a very interesting environment to develop this, this skill set. Uh, you said that lasts about five years. What did you transition to after that? Uh, then I actually went to go work for my grandfather's company. Uh -huh. um, in the early 2000s, uh, late 90s or 2000s, you know, the economy was kind of going up and down. And uh, my dad had asked me to come in and, and help out. And then, you know, the dealership ended up closing it a couple years later. But, you know, that step led into another step, which led into another step. And, you know, I started my, my our first company was, that was the first one I started after that. When the dealership closed, my dad and I started another dealership. Uh -huh. And, uh you know, it, it uh, we had our highs and, and lows, and and then around you know the mid two thousands, everything just kind of came crashing down. So it got real, everybody. Uh, yeah. For those keeping score at home, the economy was not awesome during the mid two thousands, and uh, depends on where you are and what industry you were in, but you felt it, almost certainly felt it, uh, certainly around the automotive space, certainly around the uh, housing space, yep. uh, certainly around stock investing and and those types of things. Yeah. Um, and uh, that definitely was a tumultuous time. So uh, maybe you could just fly up to the 30,000 foot view and tell us maybe one of your defining moments that, that uh, puts you on the road to where you are today. Um, any, anything that c comes to your mind? Um, I think it was probably the first time I traveled overseas to China, my first China trip, because um, it was a totally new world to me. Uh, when people talk about the anxiety they have of even getting on Alibaba and researching, I, I can really empathize with that because my first trip to China, you don't know anything. You don't know the language. I still don't know the language. But being able to use all those skills that I had developed up to that point from, you know, substance abuse counseling, uh, being a student teacher, uh, you know, working in the financial part of, of my grandfather's company, starting my own dealership, um, kind of led me to the point where I just felt like I could start making connections. You know, even when I, I, I got there and, I, and we met with our first supplier, you know, I, I kind of got a read, a pretty good read right away and was able to, you know, almost immediately start making connections. And that's where, for me, the light bulb went off of like, okay, this is my strength. This is nice. one of my strengths. Yeah, it's um, it, for anybody who hasn't been to China and you, you do some trading with China, I highly recommend going over and, and taking the plunge and experiencing it. Even if you're a little bit scared, it's it's definitely something that, uh, not everybody has that in their front of their comfort zone things to do list, but when you do, man, it can be really uh, rewarding. And in in, <laughs> in this case, Patrick was able to go, "Hey, I really am good at this, and I like it." And how many times do you think you've been to China? Any any idea of the count? Oh, I've been there probably two dozen times. I mean, yeah. right now, I I go to Asia six times a year for my job. Uh, so let's say uh, I would say three dozen times. Yeah, but even more. Yeah. Somewhere, China is always in my in my uh, itinerary, and then now I'm to the point where I, I kind of branch out and do a lot of scouting in other places. But uh, you know, China is still our our main our main source as far as uh, getting product. Yeah, it's still you know the China uh, the so-called world's factory still has the industrial base. It still has the the uh, developed kind of industries across a broad range of products really all products and services for the most part and although there's some some uh things we'll talk about maybe a little bit more in, in later on with the trade and uh, tariffs and this and that and uh that you know cause us to look in other places especially the larger the businesses are yes. um china still has a significant advantage when it comes to infrastructure and existing investment do you agree with that premise yeah definitely the infrastructure is the is the key right there the, to be able to uh you can go out and, and go to a lot of different countries right now uh and get component parts you can have one thing here made one thing there made but the infrastructure that china has of being able to take all of those components assemble it package it and have it ready to ship for you to offload on a pallet to go into a warehouse to break down to pick and pack um that's still developing in, in a lot of in a lot of countries even the up and coming countries that people are reading about now um like vietnam or malaysia or, or other places they're good at starting up now and, and building up but they don't have the infrastructure yet to support what china does 
Yeah, without a doubt. And a lot of people, they, they don't actually fully understand that it's not just a question of moving a container from point A to point B. It's all of those components that Patrick already talked about. But even more so, it's, it's literally how many people have to get greased to move that thing from there to there. Right. You know, once it gets there, who, who's getting greased to get that thing on the ship? There, there's so many things and less developed com- uh, countries. Uh, this is, you know, corruption is a massive problem. And, you know, everybody has their own opinions about corruption in China and so forth. And I'll just say whatever level of corruption exists there is highly organized and highly predictable. So yes. you know that the stuff's going to move from point A to point B on whatever basis it needs to without uh, a lot of problems. And that's definitely not the case, especially in emerging countries like Cambodia or Malaysia or wherever. Do you agree with that premise? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and in, in some ways, you know how to subvert or you know how to get into the mess. I mean, in China, that's I mean, that's how I see it anyways. That if, if you know what the process is and you know, especially a lot of it's defined by location. So even, you know, local provinces, local governments have that, uh, you know, it, it all depends on the relationship of your supplier. If you know your supplier well and you know how to subvert those things or you know how to get it done if you need to. Um, and I don't I don't like playing that way. So we don't. But, you know, it's there. I mean, and being aware of it and having that perspective, I think, gives you a little bit of an advantage when you want to get things done. Knowledge is power, everybody. Don't forget that. Uh, I often refer to this book. I don't know if you've had a chance to read it uh, ever, uh, but it's called uh, Poorly Made in China by the great Paul Midler. And it, it's, it really is, is like opening up my 15 years plus of experience over there. It's a little bit emotional for me. I'm not going to lie. Uh, and there's some funny stories and there's some you know, heartbreaking stories in there. But um, A, I would recommend that book out there to anybody listening because if you don't know how to deal with China or any country, you're at a disadvantage because they know how things work. Yes. Um, I don't know. Have you ever had a chance to read that book by chance? Oh, yeah. No, there's, there's a few stories in there that I can definitely relate to. Yeah, when you um, get shudders when you read them, that's where you, you know, you're like, ooh, spooky. <laughs> that yeah. happens to everybody. Um, yes, so, yes. Yeah, I tell you this. The, you know, China is still a viable market. There's a lot of things going on. And uh, again, we may dive in a little bit later, but – uh, just, you know, having more access to information and knowledge, you're going to be in a better position. So it's a great defining moment, Patrick. Um, what about uh, any big lessons learned along the way? Anything that you think, you know, gosh, A, I wish I would have learned that earlier, and B, I, I like to share whatever I have learned with the others out there. Um, you know, I, I love, this is one of the quotes I, I love uh, is that luck is when preparation meets opportunity. And I'm a big believer in that. You know, I, I, I give credit to people who can make things happen. I know people that, like, they have an idea in their head and they can just will it to happen. Uh, I know other people like myself who, you know, you'll grind and grind and grind. And I love the grind. But all of a sudden, an opportunity pops up and it leads you into this tangent that you don't know if it's going to work, but it's kind of exciting. And then it does work. And next thing you know, you're going to. Asia six times a year so <laughs> I mean that's that that's I guess that's kind of like my motto that and my wife and I have this thing we just we preach attitude of gratitude you know uh, every experience good or bad you, you have to be grateful for um, because you'll never have it again it'll never happen again so uh, trying to be gracious in all things is uh, is really important for us ah so 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 smart I I love first of all the concept of the attitude of gratitude just, you know, taking the time to be grateful, again, better or worse, doesn't matter. You're still ticking. You're still moving along. Things are happening. Uh, let's take a minute to appreciate that. And then that idea of being prepared, because you never know where the opportunity is going to strike. That preparation really is what creates the luck. I, I agree with that. That's a fun formula. It's a nice quote there as well. Yeah, it's, it's not mine. I think it's uh, from from good to great. So... I'll I'll take it. Yeah, I I remember I've heard it before, but it's definitely uh, good to have that reinforced. Uh, Let me ask you this. Uh, Along the way, um, you know, has there ever been a time where you're just like, you know what, this is too much for me. I'm checking out. Uh, You know, this is, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to do something different. Have you ever just kind of wanted to, you know, kind of give up and get out of what you're doing? Uh, You know, I I, I can't say that's never happened to me. But I think the times that, that it has happened, I don't know any specifically, but it usually lasts about three seconds. And I figure, well, what am I going to do? I mean, I'm in it. And I don't, I don't want to sound flippant about it, but sometimes you're like, you're in it this far. 
might as well get everything out of it as you can, you know, either before it blows up and succeeds or before it blows up and then, you know, uh, becomes ashes. So uh, normally, you know, again, being open to opportunity, just because you're unhappy or, or you want to give up, doesn't mean you can just give up and snap your fingers, poof, everything, you know, magically happens. You still have to grind your way through it, even if you want to give up. So you might as well keep going. I don't yeah. know if that makes sense. I know it's it, kind of a problem, but that's... No, it, it totally makes sense. The, the reality is, you know, there are times where we're all challenged and times where we're like, oh, is it worth it? But the reality is whether it's worth it or not, that's up to you to define. But whether you decide to go forward or unwind it, it's still work either way. So you're not getting out of the work part of it. You just right. got to kind of find the way to make it uh, palatable and, and acceptable. For me, I definitely, you know, I want people to be able to wake up in the morning and be happy and be excited about their day instead of kind of stuck in the, oh, here I go again, right? right. That, that kind of feeling of hopelessness is something that we don't want to promote. And hopefully then people will make those changes that they, they can, you know, wake up in a happy place. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you do that just naturally. Yeah. I mean, no, I don't know. I, I've told people too that, you know, I, my, when I would get down, usually it was when I was comparing myself to somebody else, whether it was my business to somebody else, my performance to somebody else. And those are times where I have to say, well, no, uh, I have to look back at what I've done and compare myself to that and measure myself by that because uh, I mean it's cliche but just comparing yourself to other people does just absolutely no good it doesn't do any good so um, you know that, that's where that grind comes through you know of not giving up boy that comparison is a dangerous and slippery slope uh, particularly in the Facebook culture that we kind of live in where it's like hey look at you know uh, Bob over there or Sue over there uh, they're, you know, vacation and they're doing all these wonderful things. And, you know, I, my life doesn't look as shiny and as cool as that one. So now I'm going to uh, feel sad about that or, or envious or whatever the case is. It doesn't help anybody. And it's also not an accurate portrayal. All of us, uh, even our, our uh, you know, fictional characters there, we all go through the ups and the downs. That's just part of life. Wouldn't you yeah. agree? Yes, I, no, I totally agree. Yeah, that's, Facebook that's what makes it, that's what makes you have that appreciation for where you're at though too. I mean, if everything was rainbow and unicorns, you would never see the rainbow and unicorns anymore. They would be annoying. It's like, yeah. why are all these unicorns everywhere? And can you get the rainbows out of my face, please? Yeah. Or it'd be just white noise in the background and you don't even notice it. Yeah, quite right. I, I totally agree. So uh, how about, uh, you know, again, we're already at the 30,000 foot view. Uh, maybe you can share a, you know, quote unquote, best day of your, either in your business or your professional life just something that stands out where you, you kind of took a minute or even in retrospect, you took time to say, you know what, that's kind of cool. I'm going to take a little victory lap here. Uh, business wise or personally, <laughs> hey, you could, whatever stands out in your mind, uh, uh, you know, well, uh, uh, personally for me is, is obviously when my kids were born. I mean, that's cliche as well, but that was it. Business wise. I think it was, for personally for us when uh, we're in the Amazon space. Okay. So, and, and I'm an ASM three guy. So uh, when we launched our first product and it was the summer of 2014 and you know, we, that was our first, our first uh, dabble into the e-commerce space and things were just kind of like, Oh, is it going to sell? You sell your first one, but then we got going and like around Christmas time, like, it was one of those things, it was a problem I never foresaw. It was a problem of having inventory because here I was like debating, do I want to spend more money and do this? You know, like maybe I should rethink this. And all of a sudden, why didn't I spend more money to do this? You know? And so being at that crux to me was, it was a really good day because then I realized like, okay, this works. Now I got to figure out like a system and a plan and, and get things in place. And, you know, and even right now we, we continue to kind of grow with that mindset. I love that. Um, so I've had a number of best days that were meltdown days. Um, uh, one of mine that stands out is this uh, way back in 1998, we ran a, uh, maybe it was 1999, excuse me. We ran a free shipping promotion and our opinion was we didn't know how much shipping cost anyway. So what's the difference? Right. And, uh, and within you know, the 14 days, we were completely out of inventory. We had no idea what was going on. We were drop shipping. Our suppliers were confused. They didn't know what orders they'd shipped, which ones hadn't shipped. We literally took the phone number off the website. We were so overwhelmed. Right. And it was a complete disaster. I mean, in every possible way. It was embarrassing. 
stuff was lost. The attorney general of New York, New Jersey, we sold something to, and he's like, where's my pallet of stuff? And uh, we're like, we don't know, but we'll FedEx another pallet to you. Right. It cost three times more than the product uh, sale. It was insane. But man, oh man, it was like, we're onto something here. And it's, it's reminiscent of the story you just told about Christmas right. time inventory. It's like, I don't know if I'm going to dip my toe in the water far enough. And then you're overwhelmed with the Christmas demand. Right. So you go from one problem, like for me, it was one problem of who getting the sales. And then my problem came, okay, maintaining it and having that consistency. Cause once you reach it and, and I think you have that feel and that taste for it, like you try to figure out a way through all the ups and downs to stay there, you know, to stay at some sort of level of consistency. And that, that really becomes a, the next challenge that I don't know if people really think about when they're in the struggle of just trying to get that first product to sell. It's true. And actually, uh, we can use our rainbows and unicorns uh, example. You know, when you're trying to just start launching a product, you're like, gosh, I wonder if I can get 10,000 a month or maybe 100,000 in a month. You know, you set whatever sites. And at the point you've been doing 200,000 a month for a while, 100,000 seems like a nightmare to you. I know. <laughs> Your perspective completely <laughs> changes. Yeah. And uh, again, I, I, there's definitely many stories I could tell about, you know, going from, you know, point A to point B and then back down to negative A. And it's like, what happened here? You know, that it's a disaster. Right. Yet we, we forget, you know, all the little ups and downs that go along. <laughs> uh, perspectives do change, it turns out. It does. So uh, tell me this, Patrick. What about um, a favorite tool or something that, that you may rely on day to day to help you carry on with your business or professional life? Uh, and it could be an app, a tool, just a procedure. What do you have to share? Um, lately, it, it changes. So, but lately, I'm a big fan of, of either uh, a podcast app or, or like Audible, right? So for me, like uh, I live a little bit farther away from my office. So when I go into my office, it's like an hour drive there, hour drive back. And I made this decision at the beginning of the year that as much as I love music and being a musician, you know, I need, I, I want, I'm, I was kind of like yearning inside and I didn't really know it, but I was yearning to learn more. So, you know, I have, I have a few podcasts that I regularly listen to. Um, and, you know, I, when I'm listening to podcasts, I, I pull out books. That's one thing I like about podcasts because you'll have somebody. And, and you've done it a few times where you've recommended a couple of books. I'm like, oh, I haven't read that one. And, you know, pull it out and put on Audible and, and you read that, you know, after listening to your podcast. And that's, that's the tool I've been using because I, I, I'm a learner and I, I love to learn. And, uh, I just feel it uses my time wisely. I feel like I'm accomplishing something in the car. Um, the one that I use every day is XC Currency. Because <laughs> right now, with as we talk about trade sometime, right now I'm watching currency evaluations because with the tariffs coming in and, and if everybody's noticing the trend, the currency is being offset and being able to uh, approach your supplier in a way that says, Hey, you know what? At midnight tonight, I got a 10% tariff going in it and it's too much for all of us to spread. And we got 301 coming out that may have all 25% tariff and we have 25% tariffs coming in tonight. So being able to have that in my back pocket to be able to use, you know, uh, kind of helps. So I, I'm always looking at the currency and then very smart, just the internet every day, you know, to get some, some, you know, tariff news. Yeah, it's definitely a, a dynamic world. And, you know, I, I do, first of all, I, I really support this idea of what uh, the great Zig Ziglar used to call automobile university, right? If you have a commute, if you have this opportunity, maybe it's you're on an airline flight, maybe, you know, you're on the beach or, you know, whatever, but, you know, taking some time listening to an audible book, listening to podcasts, whatever you can do to, I used to have the the tapes, that's right, uh, millennials. They, we used to have these things physically we had to put in the device. Oh, like six or 12 tapes that you opened yeah. up, you took out one tape at a time. It was like a, a, a big um, album of uh, tapes, and we were so pleased. And then eventually we upgraded to CDs, and we thought we were living in the modern technology. Uh, little did we know we'd all, you know, be trading bits and bytes uh, in the uh, cloud in the future. But I definitely support that idea. And, I, uh, of course, people who are listening to this already self-select themselves. They're already learners by uh, you know, by instinct. And I'm a learner as well. So I definitely like this idea of kind of using your time wisely. And I, for me, I've listened to a lot of podcasts on the way over to China and wherever. Uh, although 
usually my brain will get tired after some number of hours listening to audible or podcast. And so I'll switch either to music movies or a fictional book. Uh, one of my favorite fiction books, by the way, for those keeping score at home is, uh, Ayn, Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged. And, uh, it's the unabridged audible book is like 54 hours long and that's a few flights to China and back. So <laughs> yeah, it is. It definitely, uh, definitely adds up. Uh, any favorite book you care to share before we uh, go to a break and then come back and talk about China? Um, no, I, I, I mean, John, I mean, I like, I, I have so many, it's usually what's like the last book I read ends up becoming my favorite. Sure. Uh, I, I love Atlas Shrugged. I, I, I think that is a classic book. I also do like, I, I can't believe I'm going to say this on a podcast, but Stephen King's 1123 or 1122, 1963. Um, it is not what you think it is. It is not classic Stephen King, but it is probably my friend and I were just talking about the other day because we read it like six years ago. And it's still one of those books that we still talk about. I mean, it's a time traveling type of thing. What if Kennedy was never assassinated? Butterfly effect thing. So it takes you through all of these uh, different scenarios of. Really? Uh, I never so knew I, that I, Stephen King was right scary about. stuff. Is it yeah. scary? No, it's not scary, but it's very paradoxical. Oh, boy. I like that. Uh, all right. Well, that's a good poll right there. Um, all right. Well, uh, great job there. Awesomers, we're going to be right back after this. We're going to talk about China and, uh, and uh, commiserate with you just a little bit about the uh, ongoing uh, trade uncertainty. Uh, we'll be right back after this. Okay, here we are back again, everybody. Steve Simpson, awesomers.com podcast. And today we're talking to Patrick Mayoho. Perfect. Is that all right? Oh, yeah, man, that's uh, two for two. Although, again, full disclosure, uh, I was coached. Um, <laughs> so we, before we went to break, we teased this idea that, you know, China trade is becoming uh, it's certainly newsworthy. Uh, and I wonder if you just have some general advice. You know, people, especially with less experience than perhaps you and myself, uh, they, they, they don't know what to do right off the bat. Do you have any initial piece of wisdom that you care to impart on them to help them get through it? Don't overreact. Uh, that's my number one advice. Okay. Because it's like, it is newsworthy, but the way it's, I think being uh, delivered is more headline worthy. Right. And you see these big headlines. Um, yes, it is. Uh, you know, a 25% tariff is going to hurt, and it's going to be spread across the board, but it's, you know, it's not the end of the world. Um, people will say, well, we might just bring our stuff back here. Okay, guess what? Uh, people don't realize this, but the United States does not have the capacity to retool everything that we make overseas. And, it's, and you think, look about it, and I don't wanna make it too complex, but it's a numbers game, right? Uh, between uh, Asia and India, you have about 3 billion people. And most of those people that are working in factories are making stuff for the United States. The United States probably has what, 340 million people? Uh, maybe 60 to 80 that are maybe, you know, capable of working in factories or have factory, like we can't compete with those numbers. So you can bring everything back, but that's gonna drive the domestic prices of producing way up as well. So, um, you know, and there's all these theories about why we're doing it, you know, the administration bundling these things up as far as like the IP, the, uh, the trade deficit, you know, um, the, the uh, uh, manipulation of currency, all these things. But really, it's, this stuff's been on the books for a long time. And they've been talking about this. Other administrations have been talking about this. So I don't want it to be like this explosive new thing. But it's smart to know your numbers, you know, figure out how you can, uh, A, absorb it, absorb some of it. Pass some along to your customers, pass some along to your supplier. You know, if you have a good relationship with your supplier, you should be talking to them right now about tariff. You should be talking to them about uh, the currency, you know, exchange rate, because those are all things that factor in in getting your product purchased in China and delivered to the United States. And a lot of suppliers will work with you on that because they don't want to lose the business either. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. So the first bit of advice if I broke it down uh, is pump the brakes, you know, stop uh, uh, overreacting to news articles because 
you know, many of those are just clickbait or are, you know, designed to generate emotions anyway. Uh, we don't have time for emotions when we're making decisions that are financially based. And the second is, and you've already talked about this and uh, alluded to the fact uh, before the break that, you know, you can actually go proactively to your suppliers and talk about the currency difference. Yes. Uh, I've, I've railed on this uh, recently. I'm not sure if they've made it to air yet, but this idea that, you know, many people have had their price locked in. Some of them have even witnessed price increases over the last 12 months, while the currency has shifted 12% uh, towards the U.S. dollar favor, which means they should have gotten a 12% break on price. Yeah. And what I find is that people with less experience don't know when to push back on currency. They don't know when to push back on tariffs. Uh, and they don't know when to say, well, the, you know, they're telling me the environmental controls are pushing up the cost 20%, so I got to take a price increase. Right. How do you deal with, with kind of the conflicting messages that you're out there in the market? Um, well, first, is, I, I think complacency goes both ways, right? So uh, if you're not complacent because uh, in your business, you're not getting the best price or you're not having something in your favor, um, you're going to be proactive about it, right? But even when things are going or you have the perception that things are going in your favor, you should proactively be monitoring your business. You should be monitoring markets. I mean, the things that affect trade are, uh, you know, currency, it's labor, it's logistics, you know, it's, it can be, you know, political events. Um, so being aware of that and proactively talking with your supplier and building a relationship with them, I apologize. <laughs> no, that's all right. It's, I'm getting a big kick out of it. And I know the audience will too. So just carry on. It's wonderful. Um, but you know, that's where that relationship comes in. I mean, being proactive, even when there's not this, right. You know, even without the tariffs, suppliers should be pro pro. I mean, I'm sorry, buyers should be proactive with their suppliers. Um, not in just, it's not always about price. It's about, you know, exchanging of an idea, um, or talking about, Hey, how are things going on the floor? Can you give me some updates or, you know, even just trying to build more of a personal relationship too, which I find is very helpful. Um, and, and it's not fake either. It's just things you do naturally as you spend more time with people. So spending time with your suppliers, you know, people will want to do the uh, email or, or chat or whatever. I, that's fine. I think that's a good start. But a conversation like this on Skype, even if you can't get to China, a conversation where you can look somebody in the eye on Skype and I can see your background. You can see my background, I, you know, dogs going on, you know, <laughs> it's real, it's authentic. <laughs> but all that stuff makes a difference. I mean, there are all these little cues that you, that you soak in that you don't realize that you're taking in and it's, it's helping shape a relationship that you can be developing with somebody. Well, this is one of the, the big lessons I hope the awesomers out there take to heart, which is the fact that, you know, uh, it's fine to start the relationship in whatever way you need to, online, emails, messengers, Skypes, et cetera, um, whether they're video or text, you know, do what you got to do to get the ball rolling. But over time, if you really want to build something of substance and something of scale, it will have to transcend into a personal relationship. That's just the nature of business. Yes. And I, I truly believe, although we've had many suppliers uh, from China who come and visit us here in the U.S., when you go there, it shows them that you're serious. Yes, it, it shows that, you know what, I got a lot of people on Alibaba or wherever they're, they're texting me asking for free set stuff and samples and all this all the time. And, but you're here, you're physically here. That means something to me. Yes. The, the, uh, the boss man typically likes that, uh, as yes, opposed to the other stuff. Yeah. Let, let me guess, uh, have you put this estimate together? How many calories are in a typical Chinese meal, uh, a dinner meal? I don't worry about the calories. I worry about the sodium. Oh, well, I think you're measured by the pound either way, aren't you? Yeah, I think so. You know, uh, and that's the cool thing too. I mean, you know, I encourage people when, when they get to a certain point that you should really go meet your supplier for the fact that you're going to get perspective. You're going to basically enhance your worldview of where your product gets made, who makes it, and the relationship you have with that person. And I, I'm, I don't know about you, Steve, but I've gone out to many a meal with my suppliers between lunches and dinners, and I've been exposed to things I never thought I would eat. Some of it I liked, some of it I didn't. So, you know, some people will lose weight when they go to China. Other people like me uh, will gain weights. Yeah, I, I'm fine. I, I think China is the best meals I've ever had, and uh, we, we know how to do it. That really, to me, those meals, not – not just the, the quality of the food and the selection of the food, which is all extraordinary in its own right. Wouldn't you agree? Right. Oh, yeah. 
I mean, yeah. there, there's no meal like a Chinese meal. No, and farm the table is not a trend there. Like farm the table is a way of life. Yeah, you know? because literally you can look out the back door and go, hey, see that stall? That's where the animals were earlier that you're eating now. <laughs> and exactly. all the vegetables came from the backyard. And yeah, it's, it really is quite a magical experience for me. And I, when I say, you know, Chinese food, for anybody who's listening in Europe or the U.S., just because you went to a Chinese restaurant doesn't mean you had Chinese food. I have a very strict opinion that China, uh, food in China is very unique and very different than what we're served over here. What do you think? Very different. Uh, from the preparation to the flavors, I mean, uh, what you have here, I mean, it's, it's sort of like that caricature right. more or less of Chinese food. And I'm not, I mean, we eat Chinese food here, don't get me wrong. You know, when I, whenever I come back from Asia, the first thing my kids want to do is they want to have Chinese food. And the first thing I want is a burger. So <laughs> you know, it could be a little different, but I do. I, I think... Asian food in general, you know, uh, whatever region you're in, um, is just, it, it's really, really good. I mean, I, en I enjoy it very much. Um, you know, and even in China, there's so many different regions and so many different flavors. It kind of reminds you of the U.S. in a way. You know, you have your Cajun Southern, you know, you have your, your, your Eastern seafood, you know, you have sort of your, like your Western California fare, uh, your Texas barbecue. So, you know, yeah, I think China's a lot of the same way. It's insane. Um, and you know, it's not just the food, of course, the relationships that are built and the questions and the topics of conversation at dinner, uh, all of that's quite important because you really are building relationships, but it can't be understated the, the vastness of China. Uh, one time I was, uh, I was on about a two week trip with uh, some native Chinese guys. They were um, uh, going along with me and we were meeting new factories and various uh, types of business all through China. We went from North to South uh, mm -hmm. pretty much the whole length. And you know, at, at dinner, they, you know, they, they would serve, you know, 10 to 20 different little appetizers. Um, that's kind of the, the way they do it in China. And they got the big lazy Susan and you spin it around the table and it's like a wheel of fortune. You know, are you going to go bankrupt and take something you don't like, or are you going to hit the jackpot? Uh, yeah. But it's really, really good. Um, but the, the reality is I would ask these guys, I'm like, what's this? What's this? What's this? They're like, don't know. Never seen that before in our lives. Right. <laughs> and these are native Chinese people. That's how vast China is. And yeah. I had a similar experience where we were, uh, we, we showed up to a supplier early and actually uh, uh, my colleague at work is a, a native Chinese. And uh, so we're there. And so we eat across the street and, you know, asked, what are you known for here? And they said, oh, okay, well, here's our special. And they just laid it out in front of us and had no idea what it was. But that's what they were known for. There ended up being like this cuttlefish type of thing where they, they mixed some like noodles with it. And it was one of the first times I've seen fish in China that wasn't actually like the whole fish. They actually like filleted some of it out, which is unusual because usually it just, Very it. you're picking at it, but where they had opened it and um, filleted some of it out and added like these noodles with it and stuff. It was pretty interesting. That was done in uh, Shangshan. So. In the southern area Never it's had a that. really really fun experience and <clears throat> it's also very much so part of what they want you to do so if you go visit your factory they're going to want to hang out with you let's say you show up at 10 in the morning they're going to hang out for an hour or two hey let's do a little walk around the factory yep. now we're going to go to the office and smoke and uh occasionally talk business right you still got a lot of smoke <laughs> over there in the conference rooms these will beat the smoking thing. Yeah, I, 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 uh, that's uh, uh, still a, a, a lament that I share in China. And then they'll go, hey, let's go to lunch. And you're like, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm kind of hungry. It's midday. And it'll be a lunch spread like you can't believe. Yeah. And then you're like, well, I'm never eating again, right? Yeah. And then you'll talk a few more hours at, at the factory, depending on the amount of business you have. And they're like, all right, let's go to dinner. And, right. you know, then the real fun begins because you just don't know what's going to happen at those dinners, the drinking. Yeah, and the sometimes food. those lunches go so long, you end up, you, you get there for lunch and you stay for dinner. <laughs> it is, it is really fun. But I will say that many, many times relationship breakthroughs happen over those meals. They do. And, and, you know, I always try to, you've already alluded to this and I think very uh, insightfully so. You said, you know, the, the people who show up are more likely to kind of get the, the eye and the mind share of the, the owner. You said it in your own words, but you know, the, the business managers, the owners, whoever is looking at a situation, whether it's a price situation, whether it's a let's speed this order up situation, or just a, a general accommodation situation, they're going to look and they're going to measure that relationship and they're going to give you stuff. Um, 
I'm not saying like free stuff, but they're going to lean into the relationship in a positive way the more they feel that the relationship is on solid ground. Do, do you feel yeah, that that's Oh, I agree. I, I think they're going to engage more in, in your interests. You know, they might not do everything perfectly. They're not going to, you know, give you everything that you want, but they're going to, there's going to be a healthy bit of engagement. And the fact that when you email them, they will probably put more thought into responding to your email. Or when you talk to them, you're going to make them think, you know, there is something about just having that physical presence there. Um, you know, whether you have presence or not, having a physical presence there, showing up, you know, it does send a, a nonverbal cue that, you know, you will, it, this matters enough to you that you will show up there to make sure things are going well and to see what's going on and to uh, participate in, let's say, the manufacturing of your goods. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. And here's the, here's the best part. In almost every time I've been to factories, which is countless times, I can't even count how many factories I've been to. And in all the times I've been going to China, you know, since maybe 2002, uh, ish time frame, it I always find some little piece of information I didn't know, right? And and sometimes it was like we have this problem we can't exactly figure it out. And then you walk through the factory and you're like, well, why is this thing here? It should be over there. And and it's something so simple, but without you being there, you, you sometimes can't put the clues together. Have you ever had a case like that where you've been able to make a breakthrough just by physically being there? Yeah, yeah I've actually had a couple of those. A couple of those. You know, we do. Uh, I, I'm not, I'm not trained in it, but I'm a big fan of like the Toyota production system, right? Where you basically have to just realize that you're never going to be perfect. So you're always striving to be better. And so, you know, in, in our company, especially we do some uh, BAVE, which is a uh, uh, value add value engineering, right? So once the process gets started, you look for ways to uh, improve efficiency to not only uh, uh, reduce cost, but to improve quality. So, you know, you can always find one little thing and a lot of those little things can add up to a big thing, which makes a difference. Or you can actually see that obvious one thing of like, wait a minute, why are they doing that? You know, uh, die casting, you know, why are they doing mold release then? You know, why is it turned this way? Or why aren't they doing an ultrasonic cleaner? Like little things like that, that maybe not everybody understands, but when you're there and you see those things, they can be obvious or they can be hidden. Yeah, so often I, I remind people that um, context can be king, right? Uh, a lot of people say customer's king and content's king, but I say context is king. And without enough context for how things run, uh, how things really are in the factory, it's difficult for us to appreciate the amount of work that they go through. It's, it's difficult for us to understand some of the challenges that, that exist. They could include weather, they could include power fluctuations, whether that's metering or you know just things going in and out. There's all kinds of variables over there that you know, we just look at the end package and we're like, hey, how come my stuff isn't here on time? But there's a lot more to it than that. Uh, right. you agree with that? Yeah, and that's, and that's, again, a good way to put it because that's why I think having that Skype or even going out there, you, you have a better context because, you know, I, I think I'm making an assumption here. I, I can just kind of see this, but somebody going to the computer, they go on Alibaba they, they, or whatever site, 1688 or whatever, they find their product, they start sourcing it and they have it. And once they walk away from their computer, like to them, it disappears, right? Because they don't have that connection. They don't have it uh, physically touched and brought inside to where they, they hold on to it and always have it in their mind. So, I, you know, I, again, that's, I think that's one of the important things about when you develop that relationship, it helps you develop the context. So you put it perfectly. It, it definitely is something that, you know, it's all, for me, it's always about learning and education and trying to understand, you know, how everything works together. The more we understand that, the better we can, in fact, you know, kind of come up with uh, problem solving ideas and troubleshooting where, where trouble exists, even prevention techniques, you know, it's like, hey, you know, one thing we, we've learned, uh, there's certain production techniques that we won't use now. Uh, because we've learned over time, you know, at this time of year, it's not reliable, you know, when the humidity reaches a certain point, Mm -hmm. We know that this particular application won't work, so let's not use it at all so right. that we don't have to modify it during the course of the year. These right. are small, subtle things, but they really add up to a lot over time. Um, how, do you have any big lesson maybe that you've learned from China that you care to share? Yeah, I, and I'll admit this. Um, you know, when I first went to China, I was very apprehensive. Uh, I think growing up, um, I'm an 80s kid, you know, so I grew up in that time where 
when things were starting to shift internationally, there was that big blowback, you know, and everybody got caught up in it made in USA. I mean, I can remember the old Barbara Mandrell commercial where she had the tag and said made in USA. So um, I have, I have a better perception now, but at the time I, I was very defensive that every China supplier was out to rip you off. And I was so wrong then because not every China supplier is out to rip you off. They work with what information that they're given, right? And your supplier is only as going to be as good as the information that you give them. And English is their second language, right? So, you know, uh, trying to read between the lines and figure out really what's being said, because what they write, you may read it the wrong way. And they didn't mean it that way. And what you write may be read the wrong way, but you didn't mean it that way. So then you have this perception of, oh, my supplier is cheating me. No, your supplier is not. Nine times out of 10, your supplier is not cheating you, okay? You may feel that way, but go back to, to the context question. Put everything in context. Get all your data together, and then be a little bit more definitive in your questions and be a little bit more definitive in the information that you give them. Yeah, I definitely think that the onus is on us as buyers to have very clear specifications, very clear requirements, documented and written down, not we had a nice conversation over dinner about it, or I told them this was really important kind of you know, discussions. That's not gonna get the job done. At the end of the day, you have to document things, you have to spec things, you have to make them a part of your purchasing process. And without that, the, that's on you, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, uh, you know, the buyers have an equal degree of culpability in a production process as a manufacturer. That's my position, what do you think? Yeah, I, 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 I couldn't agree more with you. I mean, it's, it's a relationship, right? And in any relationship, you know, it's in a healthy relationship, it's 50 50. And uh, I'll go back to my earlier point the supplier is only as good as the information you give them. Yeah. You know, if you give them just a, a few 30,000 foot level things and you're assuming that they know what you're talking about because you saw a picture of it on the internet, that's not how it's going to be. I, you know, the more detailed you can be, because they can always go back and ask you questions later on it if they want clarification. But if you don't write it down, they will take, I mean, and anybody would, it's not just the Chinese, anybody okay. would They're gonna take whatever slack you give them and try to, you know, fit as much as they can in it in between the lines. Well, and uh, you know, nature. it is human nature. And yeah, that's a very good point because this happens worldwide. This is uh, the nature of the beast in manufacturing in general. But, uh, you know, to your point about the idea that, you know, most uh, Chinese suppliers are do trying to do the right thing. They're, they're really, you know, trying to, uh, you know, help you as a customer. I've had them try to help me more than one time. And the direction they were headed was like the opposite of what was good for my market, right? They're like, oh, no, no, you don't really want that color. That's a that's an ugly color. And they made it like super orange because that was cool to them. Right. And it's just, they they try to do the right thing to help me. I realized that. But right. it was the, the wrong thing because they don't understand my market. That's okay. And it was on me because we didn't have the color specified to the adequate level. Right. Uh, so I definitely appreciate that. So uh, just before we close up, I want you to I want you to take out your crystal ball, and um, uh, unfortunately, mine's been in the shop recently, so I'm going to rely on you to tell me the way it is. Uh, tell us how this uh, trade war is going to be solved. Go. A, it's not a trade war. That's the first thing I'll say. It's not a trade war. Uh, people are calling it that. It's not a trade war. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, the, the way the way the tea leaves are falling right now, it can really go either way. I mean. Uh, 201 goes in effect tonight. I think the 25% on some stuff. There's the, the next one in line. I think they're actually in public hearing now on it. Um, and they'll have some rulings, I think, at the end of the month on the 301, which basically covers everything but toys and I think some housewares, kitchenware, some other things, like almost every chapter in the HTS. But, um, you know, uh, look at what's happening right now. Uh, it can be a primer, right? So Mexico, who was staunch against all of this, they're starting to lighten up and they want to come to the table. I don't, I don't think Canada's too far behind. And really, I don't think China will be that far behind. I mean, this could end a month from now, it could end a year or two years. The problem is, as we know, it's, it's, China's a great culture. And um, as, as we're two different cultures, we have to find that median. Uh, and being able to allow China to save face and for us to be able to get, you know, the, the priorities that we have. So, you know, I, I think things will start to level out. I really do. I, I, I think, 
I could be wrong, but I think things are going to level out and we're going to get to more of a fair trade, uh, which we've been talking about for years and not having these uh, very large tariffs on everything coming from China. The other thing I think is more and more, uh, more and more work is going to leave China. And the reason why I say that is because China's leaving China. You know, uh, we talked about Vietnam uh, just a little bit earlier, and I've been going there for, for years now as well. But when I first showed up in Vietnam, this is five years ago maybe, uh, we were already late to the ball game as far as a U.S. company coming in. China's been there. Taiwan's been there. South Korea's been there. Uh, Japan's been there for years. Europeans were just starting to come there a little bit more. And now, you know, we show up five years ago. And uh, I think that's happening more and more as labor is really going to rule the market. While we have these tariffs, at the end of the day, labor is going to rule the market. And labor, inexpensive labor has been China's number one commodity for 25, 30 years. And I think that's a lot of what Vietnam offers. It's a lot what Botswana or South Africa or these other countries and probably Venezuela down the road will be that bastion of cheap labor when they get out of their political turmoil. Now, that's just all speculation, but the way the trends um, move and the way the tea leaves fall, like I said, that's, that's kind of what I think is going to happen. Ah, I love it. I agree with that 100%, by the way. And I appreciate you not taking the bait on this uh, so-called trade war. This is really just a, a back and forth negotiation. It's no different. Really, these things go in cycles, in my opinion. I quite agree with you that, you know, parties are going to come to the table and they're going to make things work. This idea that somehow the, the U.S. can be replaced for, you know, imports into China or exports out of China is uh, laughable in, in large part. And so, if people just relax and, you know, kind of stay up to, to speed on it, you know, what's the impact, work with your suppliers. It's okay to look outside of China because as Patrick points out, many China based factories already have footprints in other parts of the world. Um, you know, Taiwan, Vietnam, uh, again, Cambodia, Malaysia, there are Chinese companies that have already set up shop there because labor is in fact way less in those other countries. Uh, the China labor is going higher and higher and moving up market. So I think that's very insightful. Uh, and, and I couldn't have said it better myself. So I, I love your crystal balls in good order, Patrick. Very well done. Now, if the thing could roll off the desk and break here at any time. So, you know, don't yeah, well, it. you know, that, that's the best thing about it. Who's going to tell us we're wrong, right? Uh, and, you know, whether we're right or we're wrong, we've got a couple experienced folks here, uh, you know, making our best guess. And, you know, we'll see what happens. But the reality is this is just part of doing business. And, uh, you know, for somebody who's been doing a long time like you, you and me, it's, we just don't get ourselves uh, too burnt out of shape uh, or bent out of shape about it. So uh, any final words of wisdom for the customers out there? Um, you know, as far as when it comes to sourcing, uh, what's what we most have been talking about, you know, don't be afraid to reach out. Don't be afraid to, you know, get on the internet, look at flights you know, like going to Asia, you know, look at the area, read about the area where your supplier is and have it in your head that, you know, it may be a good idea for me, you know, to go to China to meet my supplier or, you know, if your suppliers in the US, uh, maybe they're down in Indiana, you know, it's a good idea for me to go to Indiana uh, and meet my supplier. Um, I know China seems daunting and I get it because it was daunting, I guess, for me that first time. Just remember, you're only in China for the first time once. So once you do the first time, it's fine. You're, you're an expert. Yeah, it really is uh, worth doing. And there's lots of ways to make it easier on uh, folks. I've had a number of people contact uh, our simoglobal.com uh, China team where they're like, we don't know what to do. And so they, they hire some of our people to you know, help them out as translators or whatever. And we, we really only do that for very select cases. There, there's plenty of translators out there. Uh, the people that I deal with, my team, they're, you know, very high level people. You know, they've either worked at manufacturing or on the buy side for, for long, long periods of time. And it, it's just not as hard as people think. They have beautiful subway systems. They have, you know, really easy ways to get around. And once you kind of figure it out, it's just not that much to it. Uh, Especially down south, the, the metro system, like around the Guangzhou, Dongguan area. I mean, the metro systems between all of those cities and the high speed rail. I mean. Uh, I'd rather, I'll have suppliers say to me, oh, I'll come pick you up. And I'll think, no, I'd rather spend an hour standing on the subway and maybe in the high-speed rail than a three and a half hour car ride. 
you know, cause I'm a big guy. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm six, three, you know, rocking around two forty. So, you know, sitting in a, in a smaller uh, car is not really my idea of a good time. Boy, I think <laughs> that's quite right. This is one of those cases where they really want to roll out the red carpet and show you high respect. Yes. And it's like, you know what, I'll take the hustle. Uh, it's a lot faster. And it's actually quite uh, the, the trains. I always make a joke when I'm over there about, all right, now listen, uh, you know, when you see the farmers get on with their, uh, their uh, pigs or their chickens, uh, don't look them in the eye, you know, they're embarrassed to be right. And so I've got everybody kind of wired up and they're like they don't know what to expect and then they go onto these bullet trains that are world class the u.s has nothing as good as that right. and they're like what you know steve was completely uh hornswoggle on us there so you set up a scene like out of spies like us and then you know you give them star trek so that's exactly fun. right yeah that's a very good comparison well done on the 80s poll there Thank uh, you. oh man uh well doctor uh i think that's it for me uh any uh uh, any way that you know do you have any way that you want to fi have people find you online uh do they twitter you or how do you how do you uh, stay you know, I'm, I'm on i'm on linkedin um you know i can give you uh like my, my i have i have no problem giving out my personal email so i can put my personal email on on the show notes if you want or whatever but uh, linkedin is probably the easiest way I think LinkedIn, it works really well. And uh, we'll make sure we find your LinkedIn profile uh, and, and link it on the page because it just is a very professional way for people to kind of stay connected with one another. Your experience in China is really extraordinary. A lot of people don't realize, you know, it's to do business in China is more than placing a few purchase orders and getting a few shipments in. It's very complex. And when you're dealing with, you know, over the course of years, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of product, it takes some skills and, and uh, Patrick certainly got those skills. So thank you again for joining me, Patrick. Uh, Osmers, we will be right back after this. <laughs> 